Welcome to Independent Truths with Scott Atlas, brought to you by the Independent Institute, my show that brings a uniquely rational perspective to important issues facing society today. Today's guest is Naomi Wolf, best-selling author, columnist, and professor, a graduate of Yale University, a Rhodes Scholar, and a doctorate recipient from Oxford University. She is co-founder and CEO of a company called Daily Clout, whose mission is to empower people with information, facts, and opinion from all viewpoints that uh, enables citizens to be well-informed and exercise their rights to be directly weighing in on issues so their voices are heard at the local, state, and federal level. She's also the author of a widely read substack called Outspoken. Since the publication of her 1990 landmark bestseller, The Beauty Myth, uh, she has authored seven bestsellers that have been translated worldwide, including her prescient book in 2009, Give Me Liberty, a Handbook for American Revolutionaries. She was an advisor to the Clinton re-election campaign and the Vice President Al Gore. She has written for every major news outlet in the United States and many globally. Thank you for joining us and stay tuned. Okay, Naomi Wolf, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. So first, I want to start by thanking you for being so outspoken in trying to restore the semblance of independent journalism and accountability of the media to American citizens. You know, I think that this is one thing that we've all learned, but I, speaking for myself, have learned how important the media really is. I never understood that any free society it, it critically depends on an honest, ethical, factually based media. And I'm I'm very concerned because I feel that's dangerous uh, when it's missing, which that's the situation we're in right now. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, there's so much you don't realize the importance of to what's gone. <laughs> and we complained a lot about the press, but um, there's never been a time in my living memory when the legacy media was as corrupted and, and so fully abdicated its responsibility as in the last um, four years. Uh, and I do spend a lot of time on that. Um, I just wrote an essay about it on my Substack, outspoken about the how independent journalism collapsed and, you know, the collapse so predated 2020 and the pandemic, but it kind of set the stage for how easy it was in 2020 to the present um, for great powers to basically roll up independent legacy media and, and make it impotent, essentially. Right. I mean, I think uh, I frequently think of it that the pandemic exposed a lot of things that were really there and we sort of either minimized it or intentionally ignored it or trusted things beyond what we should have. And, and a lot of your writing, I mean, you have written several best-selling books that are so critical but prescient. Uh, it's amazing to me uh, to think back on your 2009 book 15 years ago already that uh, really predated the, at least the, the the panic that some of us feel right now about how things have deteriorated. So for the purpose of people who really uh, haven't followed you in your career, I, I thought I'd start with your personal journey, you could uh, sort of articulate a little bit uh, what what's happened to you since you sort of burst on the scene with your uh, The Beauty Myth book in 1990 and how your career has changed and, and what happened to to sort of make things come this fo this uh, forward in, in what you're doing. Um, yeah, boy, I, I have to say, I feel like I haven't changed at all, <laughs> but the world around me has changed so radically. Um, yeah, so I was... 26 when my first book, The Beauty Myth, came out, and it was a kind of right book at the right time, a big international bestseller, which is kind of weird. It's kind of weird being um, well-known at a very young age, um, but it was fortunate. It was lucky for me because I got I had the privilege of being a nonfiction writer for eight more books over the course of the next 35 years. Um, but in all of my books, I feel like there's a very clear through line for all of my books, whether it's The Beauty Myth or the book you mentioned, The End of America, which was actually written during um, the Bush II era, and it foretold how easily America could succumb to a fascist coup, basically. 
um, or books like Misconceptions, which looked at corruption in the birthing industry uh, for profit, or um, books like, um, gosh, Give Me Liberty, uh, which was kind of a sequel to The End of America, which taught people how to take charge of engaging with democracy, you know, in a, in a one-to-one way, the way our founders intended. Um, and my my most recent books, I, I feel, are, you know, follow up from those, uh, The Bodies of Others, which was about the pandemic, um, kind of identifying who the bad guys were and why, why there was a war against the human, which is in the subtitle. Um, and, and then the sequel to that, which is Face and the Beast, which just came out. Um, and so to me, the through line is liberty, you know, like whether it's feminism, which is supposed to be about the freedom of half the population to make their own decisions, determine their own destinies, um, or whether it's uh, calling attention to threats to civil rights and civil liberties, you know, as with the end of America or recognizing, I mean, it's so, to me, it's so congruent with all those concerns you know, my last two books, which are about, I guess, center on health freedom or medical freedom um, and autonomy at a time when public health, as you know better than anyone, has been used as a proxy for a fascist takeover of our system. Um, to me, they're they're all the same set of questions, and I haven't deviated. In fact, the reason it looks like my career has done a 180 is that um, – in asking the same kinds of questions, it's always been my job to ask, in this case about noticing that women were saying on social media that they were having menstrual problems, uh, subsequently receiving mRNA injections, um, which is totally my beat. You know, female health and reproductive health and sexual health, you know, many books about that um, I've written. Um, I was, to my surprise, deplatformed by Twitter and YouTube and Facebook all at once and uh, smeared globally in a way I didn't understand because I didn't understand the role of AI in reputation management at that time. And I was kind of ousted uh, in a very dramatic way from my comfortable perch um, you know, in the media elite circles of New York and LA and Washington. And that's the subject of um, Feast of the Beast because since then, it's kind of a blessing in disguise, but in being kind of um, canceled, for asking the same questions I've always asked, which turned out to have been true and accurate. In fact, women uh, have been confirmed to have had horrible reproductive problems from this mRNA injection. There's a drop of 30, 13 to 20% to live births as a result of this. Um, but as a result of being ostracized from the left for the last three years, I've been talking to everyone else, um, specifically or notably um, conservatives and libertarians, and men and women of faith, a lot of uh, religious leaders who do want to hear about these issues and who do want to hear about threats to liberty and, and, and you know, threats to human physical well-being, threats to babies, threats to the ability of human beings to, you know, create families. Yeah, um, what, what, so so that can, is the story. Sure. Yeah, if I can interrupt, I'm, su- I'm surprised at how everything has become so politicized. I never thought freedom was a political issue and I've never been a political person. And, uh, you know, it's just shocking how while you may have been one political party, uh, you end up being canceled by that political party because they assume you are of the other uh, political party. And it's just it's a mess because not everything is political and nothing certainly on the level that we've seen in this country. I want to talk about something else that is political, really, which is uh, and get into ethics and freedom of speech in journalism specifically, based upon the late 2022 polling by Gallup about trust in the media. And of course, we've seen a lot of drop in institutions, precipitous drops, but the media in late 2022, Americans were asked uh, how much trust you have in the media. And only a third, 34%, said they had a great deal of trust or a fair amount of trust and 66%, two thirds of Americans said none at all or not very much trust. So that's one huge problem when we rely on media for our information as any civilized society does. And then the core, the second sort of bullet point under that is it's political. There's a shocking difference. 70% of Democrats say they have a great deal of trust in mainstream media, 
whereas only 14% of identified Republicans and only 27% of independents. So, I mean, this to me is very strange. Uh, and, I, and I don't even understand the, the, the reason for that political disconnect, but the precipitous trust is so dangerous because not everyone, as you know, has time. And we, we all rely to a variable extent on the information stream from the media. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the trust in media and sort of why that happened and also a sort of how to how to fix that. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, there's so much in what you said. Uh, I just want to note before I turn to, to your question that um, the people who canceled me were the Biden administration uh, for whom I'd voted. Um, so I, I don't agree that I was canceled because of a perception that I was of the other party. I think that happened to you, which is really interesting. Um, I think I was canceled because they were committing a massive crime. And my questions were going to lead directly to the massive crime that they were in the middle of committing and they were determined, determined to continue to commit, which is the rolling out of these um, harmful injections and the alliance with, as I see it, with China and the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, to basically you know, destroy the United States as a sovereign nation kind of once and for all. Um, so now turning to your question about the, the media, yeah, I, I'm not surprised at that. Um, kind of uh, set of answers in that poll because I'm still in touch with some people from my old life and they there's a chapter in, in Face of the Beast called Dear Conservatives I Apologize in which like it's like Yom Kippur you know Asham Nu Bagad Nu you know like I've done this I've done that you're supposed to like confess your 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 sins or your shortcomings in the past year and in that essay, I'm like enumerating all the lies I believed from the legacy media about conservatives and about President Trump. Um, it, you know, whether it was the Steele dossier or the Russia hoax or you know January sixth narratives, I just believed them, and I believed them because uh, I used to think that Republicans were the big fat cat, you know, corporatist capitalists who were in charge of everything and, you know, Democrats were the scrappy underdog, you know, rooting for every man and every woman. Um, but when it comes to the media now in 2023, 2024, it's, it's a monolith um, owned by the left, to my astonishment, and really enthralled to these um, meta-national interests that you don't even see, like Associated Press, which went after me and always does every chance it gets since I've begun working on Pfizer documents. They're in a memorandum of understanding with um, Xinhua, I beg your pardon, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, uh, kind of propaganda arm. And these meta national influences go beyond anything left or right now. Um, one reason that the American media, legacy media, got on the bandwagon with all of the lockdowns and mandates and smearing you and smearing the signatories of the Great Barrington Declaration and smearing, you know, everyone who asks questions about the Wuhan lab uh, origin uh, of the virus, um, they took millions of dollars from uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and to overcome vaccine hesitancy, and then directly from the CARES Act to overcome vaccine hesitancy. And this money flowed all the way down to trusted messengers at the lo most local level, like little churches and synagogues, for instance, took the money, little Korean dance troops in Queens took the money. You know, everyone took the money. Um, but but uh, interestingly, for reasons I don't quite understand, a lot of conservative independent media either wasn't offered the money or didn't take it. No one offered me the money. Uh, I doubt anyone offered you the money. Um, but for that reason, in the last two or three years, people like my mom, who read the New York Times and watch CNN and Re, you know, listen to NPR are told all the time that their facts are the only facts, their experts are the only experts, and also the, that conservatives are insane and dangerous um, and hateful and racist and misogynist and homophobic um, and, and want to destroy democracy and that President Trump is going to you know, anyone who likes him is a sociopath and that anyone who has a gun is a sociopath. So a bunch of narratives 
that uh, understandably lead to people on the left being unable to think in any nuanced way about any of the events surrounding them yeah, because I think they're getting propagandized so Yeah, what, what you're illustrating is how effective the propaganda is. And, uh, you know, you hate to be extreme and make analogies to some of these horrendous episodes of history like Nazi Germany, for instance, but the, the effectiveness of the propaganda technique uh, which I believe is, is really twofold. One tactic is to make the other side, the, the non-believers, the people speaking against the narrative, dangerous. If you say they're dangerous, that incites fear into the, the people you're trying to convince. And the second part, uh, which is what you're talking about with the cancel culture, is the actual censorship, the cancellation uh, and the, the snuffing out of the op outside view. And so that when that alternative view is voiced or me meets the consumer of the media, it becomes as if it's such a tiny minority that it's easily dismissed. And so the censorship is all part of it. I mean, it's really, uh, it, it's, it's really quite striking how it's the tactics are not just in these episodes of history, but also like right out of 1984. I mean, it's so Orwellian. I hate to overuse the phrase, but it's, it's shocking, the parallels of this. You know, I, I, I think that one of the things that people in the media don't understand, I like your comment, is they caused the lack of trust with these things. They, they, they literally are to blame for the vaccine hesitancy by not giving the information to people. They caused the, uh, the lack of trust in institutions and in, including in the media. And I sort of wonder, uh, because the, to me, the, the answer is, the media changed or or at least became obviously focused on persuasion rather than informing. Editorialized media is essentially all the media now, whether it's TV or newspapers. And I wonder, uh, and you know, you were you were involved directly in the media in the main newspapers all over the world in the most prestigious news outlets in the US, the UK, and and everywhere. I mean, did that really exist before and we were just blind to it? Or is this an abrupt change? When you say that, do you mean um, the, the bias in the, the media? The, 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 uh, the intent to persuade in a biased way rather mm. than inform. Or did, or I were mean, you, you know, I, yeah. I just wonder if we were, we were just not aware. I, I'm, yeah. trying to, I'm trying to get at, was I that dumb <laughs> as a younger person? Uh, that I didn't even understand what was going on. Right. Well, I do think what you said, uh, Dr. Atlas, at the beginning, when you said that the pandemic has kind of, you know, stripped the, the veil off of a lot of institutions is very true. And I, I do think we can see what's wrong with the news media more clearly. Now, everybody can, which is why, you know, there was a poll recently that, you know, as you as you mentioned, that, that the majority of people don't trust the media. Um, but how can I put this? There have been better times in the news business. Like in my essay, I pointed out that, you know, from the end of the Second World War to about 2010 was sort of a golden age in American journalism. There were basic ethics, even if, you know, they weren't always adhered to. There were certain norms and you were supposed to aim at fact, you know, two sources um, before something became a fact. And if there was an error, you're supposed to correct it publicly, you know, other ethical journalism practices. And that all changed with the rise of the internet. Um, and then publishers didn't have a reliable business model. So they had to really chase uh, clicks. And uh, it's much easier to do that with a shocking story or a scandal or lies, you know, than sober news reporting. The other interesting thing, interesting to me, it may be too nerdy for you, for you for your audience, but because it's very in the weeds, is that the internet killed the classified section and it was the revenue from the classified section as humble as that is uh you know selling cars and refrigerators and help wanted ads that allowed for robust independent investigative reporting that has now been killed off because there's no revenue from yeah that's, um, that's an interesting from point. that i mean i but yeah go mm -hmm. ahead no i was just gonna say i i want to caution like how can i put it the sober you know, fact-based, brief, shining moment we had for about 60 years was preceded by 
you know, 150 years of absolute yellow journalism on both sides. I mean, the press in Jefferson's day was, you know, absolutely vitriolic. And, you know, there were dozens of newspapers in Walt Whitman's New York and they were all, you know, he worked for some of them. They were all making things up all the time. So um, I would say that um, it's, it, what you're remembering though, in our, in the, in the, the pre 2020 era is that, um, there, you weren't supposed to like take people out if they didn't commit a crime, right? You weren't supposed to, yeah, uh, you were supposed to label opinion as opinion and a news feature as a news feature. And that did, um, collapse. It's been collapsing bit by bit since about 2010, but that, really escalated in the, in my view in the last four years when um news outlets around the world were really literally printing the same stories kind of you know issued i think by ai personally as i mentioned um because you can't there's no human ability to run the same news story about news story about don't hug grandma you'll kill her at diwali and at thanksgiving and at hanukkah you know like around the world it was the same story in 126 languages human beings don't have the ability to do that so there was like a centralized propaganda arm issuing these stories to all these legacy news outlets and they acted like stenographers um so people see through that more now which is good um and and the numbers for cnn and the new york times are plummeting but the other thing that's a factor in people seeing through it is also salutary, which is you and me and our friends, meaning the last four or five years, well, since the pandemic especially, have been an absolute golden age of independent voices and a few technologies like, um, you know, like this platform, you know, platforms that allow for easy podcasting are like people haven't registered what a, a seismic shift that is, that anyone can have a voice. And an audience. And I think um, this was the promise, yeah. really, uh, at least for my naive look at it, when when the internet came out, we all were, I think most people were, oh, this is going to be fantastic. More information, the better. And, and you're right. You're pointing out a lot of, of course, uh, you and I are examples of this, but many people, of course, get information now independently, and it has allowed independent voices. But on the other hand, it's also allowed in a very ironic way censorship and persuasion with censorship. And I think we saw that uh, on on Twitter uh, with or without the government. I mean, I, I was blocked from Twitter when I was advising the president. I mean, this is insane. People need to know what the advisor to the president is saying. Uh, wow. the, the sort of misinformation campaigns about uh, Trump uh, and the Russia thing, the whole thing. And it was uh, really... A used in a very, very harmful way, I feel. And it was shocking to me. I never understood uh, that digital information was actually also an avenue for control. And I, and I think this this is really sort of the irony of the situation. We're now in a situation where we depend on digital information and digital information uh can be controlled, and luckily we have at least one billionaire who con who is concerned about freedom of speech, and that happens to be Elon Musk. Uh, in a society that we can we we care about, uh, we we depend on billionaires now more than ever. I want to talk about your company, Daily Clout. I think this is very important in so many ways, and and one of the things that I first uh, noticed about Daily Clout when I was looking at it was how you spoke about what you alluded to earlier, the society professional journalist code of ethics and how this is so critical uh, to the the basis of everything you're trying to do, everything Daily Cloud does. So uh, first of all, before we get into Daily Cloud, what happened to that code of ethics? We saw the same <laughs> parallel destruction and complete absence of ethics in public health guidance. You know, we shifted, we meaning the people in the leadership shifted the burden of the pandemic to the poor people, used mm. children in an attempt to shield adults with injections of experimental drugs. I mean, with no benefit to children, et cetera, et cetera. But the, what, what is happening on the ethical side uh, of journalism? We can agree without even going into detail that the ethics have, have been destroyed for a variety of ways. Uh, and I, I think uh, you're you're trying to fix that partly with Daily Cloud and partly with just simply educating the public. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on Daily Cloud and specifically 
the code of ethics that journalism is supposed to uh, adhere to. Right. Um, so much. Well, I started Daily Cloud after having had the experience of being a political consultant to um, President Clinton's re-election campaign and also to Vice President Gore's um, presidential campaign. And I saw how people were excluded from having an impact on legislation. Um, and so I knew that the solution was digital. So I, I started this company that has something called Bill Camp, which is a socially shareable digital database of laws, state and federal laws. So, you you know, anyone sitting at, on their phone or desktop can stop a bad bill or, you know, launch or promote a good bill that they think is a good bill anyway. And, um, and it, you know, make or break, break legislation and, and understand what it, it says. Um, we've just added a feature that has a button called explain where all these bills, which have like incredibly tortured language, deliberately designed to obscure the meaning of the bill is, is kind of presented in a simple way. Um, I, I want to say also, right away and interrupt sorry. and say this is so important so to important. people. It's it's I I really think of all the things you're doing, this is so important, and I and I'm very With personally this. thankful for it. The the Thank you. Obs, the obscuration of what these bills say. I don't I I don't even I I really actually do not believe that that most people in Congress even read the bills. They they don't they know. Can't. They have their staff. Give yeah. them a synopsis. It, it's right. it's sort of a it's it's a real it's it's an embarrassment the way the country's government is functioning, frankly. But you're you're really going to instill citizenship involvement and understanding of these of these very complicated uh, bills, and I think it's it's so critical. I recommend everybody go to Daily Thank Cloud. You. Thank you. And so to answer your question about ethics, um, yeah. I think that what's happened to journalistic codes of ethics kind of parallels what's what I learned happened to the Hippocratic Oath, which has changed apparently. Um, and I I gather that medical students are no longer required to take the Hippocratic Oath. Um, and the same thing has kind of happened with journalistic codes of ethics. You're supposed to, you know, there's some things that haven't changed, right? The latest um, Unit of Journalist Code of Ethics still has, there's supposed to be a bright line between advertising and editorial. And that's something I also explained in my latest essay that, you know, a lot of um, new voices don't understand how important this is. But if if there, if it's an ad, you've got to say it's an ad <laughs> very clearly sponsored content so that no one can um, imagine that it's actually editorial content. Um, you're supposed to disclose conflicts of interest. Uh, if you're for instance, the example I gave is, um, I'll reference my husband, who's uh, uh, an expert on military intelligence, but I'll say, disclose, you know, Brian O'Shea, disclosure, my husband, or Harvey Risch, you know, of the wellness company, Dr. Harvey Risch, of the wellness company, disclosure, our sponsor. Um, you're supposed to, uh, you know, have two sources. Uh, you're supposed to protect the privacy of sources who speak to you off the record. You're you're supposed to... Um, uh, I mean, be accurate. If you make a mistake, you're supposed to correct it publicly and issue Which, a correction. Which, of course, that, that that right there has been completely absent. There is totally. no there is no correction on things that were written that are completely false. Never, and I think that's that's so harmful that there there can't be anything more basic to an ethical journalist than reporting truth. Right. Uh, and when you've made, even if it's a mistake, I mean, I just I don't I I'm I'm still a little bit of an idealist still after all that's happened it's shocking to me that shocking. people don't care about truth well you i'm sure you've been in this situation as have i you know trying to these days you try to call the new york times corrections editor and say this is factually wrong and they won't fix it <laughs> you know and you'll, you can show them it's factually wrong and they won't fix it that's a an abdication of basic journalistic ethics actually so, you know this yeah. this brings up something uh which is that we're in a in a world where there are these people called fact checkers and fact checking websites and things, and and the sham of it is the fact checkers are completely unethical, lying or distorting what was truth. And and I right. just I, I don't know how you recover from that really because most people are are generally good people. I think I think most of us want to believe things at face value, and we've been taught to respect these so called authoritative voices. 
uh, like it has been in the past, the New York Times, and I put that in quotes. But uh, you know, what what do you do with fact checkers? I, I wonder if uh, the a- the answer is we need we need competition on fact checking. I yeah, mean, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know idea. how to fix it because we don't want right. we don't want to have more regulation because I don't mm. trust anybody at this point to regulate yeah. truth or fact. Right. Right. I mean, I think that people have learned very well. A lot of people have learned how to do primary research and how to how to check sources, which is beautiful. That's exciting, you know, and that the task, you know, for kids is to make sure that that, you know, inherit that the next generation inherits those skills. Um, so I'm not worried about, I mean, I know what you're talking about. NewsGuard, for instance, <laughs> is always trying to say we're a right-wing conspiracy theory site. And they have no evidence for that. We're totally nonpartisan. Um, we cover things like a C media doesn't cover. As you said, it's politicized. But just because we talk about like medical freedom doesn't make us right-wing. Or, you know, if we talk about the Second Amendment, you know, it doesn't make us right-wing. We present, we try to present both sides of the story. Sadly, it's liberals who won't debate anyone anymore. I keep trying to get people to come on my site and present the argument for green energy when I run a piece against green energy or try to present the argument for Ukraine when I run a piece, you know, criticizing the war in Ukraine or, you know, run a piece, um, you know, supporting President Biden when someone's been critical of him. They won't do it. They won't engage with debate anymore. And I'm sorry, that was a bit of a a detour from your question, but it's all related, right? But, it's all oh, about yeah, the deterioration absolutely. of of um, of discourse. I mean, so, that's how, yes, that's how to, the, mm. the basic premise of arriving at at correct information is to and to be a critical thinker. Frankly, we can't even teach people critical thinking without hearing two sides or different views. Totally. I mean, that's by definition. It shouldn't even have to be said. Right. Yet we're living in a world where uh, we don't want we meaning many people do not want to be challenged or have any other view even heard again like censorship is not just stopping the person from speaking it's stopping everyone else from hearing and and this is this is the big danger right exactly which is why to your question i'm more excited about people you know man or woman in the street demanding primary sources and checking for themselves and informing each other oh this is a good source or this is a bad source um, than interposing any like intermediary that are fact checkers because, you know, what's like, what's, how can I put it? it I, th- I, what I'm bothered about is the nanny nannying of people's cognition. And I want to go back to a time in which we were all treated as adults, um, and entrusted to make our own decisions about our health or about what we believed or didn't believe. You know, we were we were expected to be able to handle hearing hateful speech or bigoted speech or whatever because that didn't mean we became zombies, right? right? We and could, you know, frankly, you know, with with independence, with autonomy comes responsibility, and that's good. Yeah, you you can't have freedom without responsibility for for figuring things out. It, it can, Absolutely. It, so I, I think you're right, and I think that's a very sort of positive. Uh, answer to what has happened here with with journalism and the media is that yes, just like trust has been undermined, okay, but the positive is that now there's a burden of responsibility on individuals to think for themselves and to figure out what's going on. And I, and I don't think uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a very good thing. You know, before we finish, there's a lot of things we could talk about. But while I have you, because you know, you became famous for your book on. Uh, the the beauty myth the I mean this is a different era really but it's, yeah. it's sort of this is something that really I'm I'm very interested in because as a as a medical science person as a health policy person I'm very concerned that yes it's true there is no question that society glamorized women's bodies and women's appearances to the point of uh, harming people psychologically and creating a lot of eating disorders, et cetera. And I, and I'm fully, uh, agree with that. I think everyone does, but I think we, we have something very different going on though. This is sort of off topic, but, uh, we have the, we have a massive obesity problem in the United States. It's, it's, it's a severe, it gets worse. It's the biggest risk factor for all kinds of diseases, including more than a dozen cancers. You know, all this and I'm just shocked at what I've seen over the years, uh, which is a glorification 
almost of obesity. And I think it's fascinating when you walk around the lower Manhattan and Soho or whatever, you see the billboards, you see the cover of Cosmopolitan, the cover of Vogue, the cover of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition, somehow pretending not only that uh, being obese isn't bad for you, but somehow this is glamorous. This is this is the new the new healthy look is being massively obese. This was on the cover of Cosmopolitan uh, within the past few years, and I, I think it's yeah. so dangerous uh, that we are we are now. This is another a complete abrogation of ethical duty here. Journalism and the fashion industry has has glamorized obesity as if it's bad, as if it's harmful to tell people it's bad to be fat. It's right. bad to be fat, but it's right. bad not because you're a bad person, of course. Right. It's bad because it's very harmful to your health. And I sort of right. think this is this is really a, a shocking change from what we used to see. So that mm-hmm. that's like the first sure. topic I would like you to comment on this. But the second point I want to make, which I find fascinating, is that you see all kinds of overweight and obese models in women's fashion. Good. It's very interesting to me. You never see it in a man's fashion ad. That's never. interesting. You don't see it's any obese male models mm-hmm. modeling clothing. And, and I just, I don't even know what that means, but I sort of, because you're 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 sort of, uh, you you really were very outspoken about this. And I, I wonder what you think now, and even if you've noticed this. Yeah. Well, I definitely know what you're talking about. And you're right. I mean, you know, glamorizing unrealistically thin models is not by any means our biggest problem anymore. Um, I have noticed the trend you're talking about. I I think it's alongside a trend that I was just looking at of um, kind of Maoist iconography in women's fashion, like the de-sexing of women, um, making everyone look sort of like a soldier or androgynous, exactly. And the same is happening a different way for men, but it in specifically that there are obese models who are women, I see that as part of a general attack on women um, that I'm seeing culturally. And I, I think that's of a piece with the general view I have that um, America is under attack culturally and uh, politically and um, militarily and through the pharmaceutical flow um, and Western Europe as well. So I think that what is happening is that there's an attack on our symbols, you know, whether it's the, you know, swimsuit model, uh, you know, the, the iconic um, Sports Illustrated swimsuit uh, edition, um, which had a, a, a trans person on the cover. Um, I have nothing against trans people, but that's a big kind of symbolic gesture, right? Um, you know, the, the way our president keeps checking his watch when there's a military funeral, um, that's a big symbolic gesture, you know, not ending speeches with, um, and God bless the United States of America, which presidents have used forever. That's a big symbolic gesture. Uh, and you're seeing it all over the West, you know, statues of of, of Jefferson taken down, statues of, um, you know, founders in Britain taken down. Um, it's just a wholesale attack on on our core, um, I mean, I wrote an essay about like drunk Santas, right? And you like, you, you don't see nice Santas anymore. Like this is all a cultural attack. Right. So it, it's sort I, of an attack on Western mm-hmm. civilization and exactly. all traditional values. Exactly. Uh, but I, and I think you're you're right. Uh, and it reminds me of uh, speaking with Riley Gaines about what's happening in women's sports. There mm-hmm. is a, a, an amazing uh, and, and really uh, nefarious attack, I agree with you, on women. Uh, mm-hmm. By this this sort of uh, defeminization of women, there's a, a and it and it and you don't see it as much on men. You do see right. it, but but I think it's I think it's sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. I think I think it's happening in a different way with men. I mean, with women, when you make when you strip away any kind of aspirational femininity, um, you're doing a certain kind of damage to you know, romance and love and attraction and the things, I mean, there's this insistent attack on the family, right? Well, you know, families start with people falling in love with each other. And these fashions are kind of proliferating images that no one can fall in love with, right? Uh, If they're heterosexual, um, because there's no 
there's nothing there. Like, what are you? I, I don't know. It's you know, that's not pretty. Um, and in addition, there's I think what's happening with men is actually biological. And I haven't written about this yet. I'll be interested to hear your thoughts about that. But I'm seeing a anyway a glorification of very attenuated men. Very, um, and I'm seeing I'm seeing a change in men. Right, young men don't look the same the attenuated as, masculinity yeah exactly absolutely and, and young men i don't know what's going on and i'm worried that you know there's stuff in vaccines that we don't even know about going back even before the mrna injection but why do men in their 20s not look anymore the way men used to look in their 20s you know when i was in my 20s right they're they're they don't have they don't have full beards they don't have square jaws they don't have deep voices they don't have broad shoulders they don't have all the things that we used to associate with adult mature masculinity. And if you just look at like male celebrities with their sons, you can see this remarkable difference. Um, the older men look much more masculine and there's something happening in our environment that's demasculinizing young men. I've heard that it's um, estrogen, you know, estrogenizing hormones in plastics. I've heard that it's all kinds of things, but something's going on. And I guess, you know, my husband's a, a, a former soldier. And so I, I think about, you know, this the way he's taught me to think about it, which is if you've got very weak feminized men, it's very easy to invade a country. Like yeah, men well, are good it's for certainly a, it's a problem. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, that's, that's a whole show in and of itself. I, I would love to continue this. And, uh, because I think it's, it's another shocking thing that's happening that we're observing, but, uh, I'll just, uh, finish here don't want to take too much of your time and say thank you so much for, for joining really great great pleasure to have you keep up thank the you. fight independent thank journalism you. it's the answer like independent everything else uh, because the institutional trust has been lost for good reason uh, yeah. and we'll, we'll leave it at there uh right there thank you again naomi and uh we'll pick it up on uh, on the on another time for all these other topics Thank you for listening to Independent Truths with Scott Atlas. If you want to find out more about today's guest, Dr. Naomi Wolf, follow her Substack, Outspoken with Dr. Naomi Wolf, as well as her work on Daily Clout that informs the public and allows citizens to draft, share, and be active in legislation. And don't forget to subscribe to this show on YouTube, as well as Spotify, Apple, Google, and anywhere else you're listening to podcasts right now. And I'll see you next time.